Hi, I'm Jess Barrett for Stage One, and we're here outside the Courtyard Theatre about to talk to Carol Bunyan about her new play, The Company of Strangers. Let's go. Hello. Hello. So we're here at the Courtyard Theatre, yes. where you're putting on your play. What is it about the theatre that appeals to you? It's a very friendly place. It's a very good place to be. Um, my producer, Alan Charlesworth, who I wrote the play for, mm. tragically, uh, Alan's brother, David Charlesworth, died quite unexpectedly. He was at my age. And Alan was left a legacy, which he hadn't expected. And he said, let's put it on ourselves. Let's, let's do it. And he wonderfully has backed the, the play and put it on and paid for the whole darn thing. Wow. with his inheritance. And Alan found this theatre and said, I like the main house, it's a good space. So this sort of filled the bill, really. This play has strong parts for older performers generally, which is something lacking in contemporary theatre nowadays. Certainly is, yes. One up for the oldest. Thirty years ago, I'm that old, chums, uh, I wrote a play called The Ladies, which, start, which was all women all middle-aged women, the whole cast. And there was a great huge shock horror from the press. <gasps> Play about women! I mean, we're not guinea pigs, you know, there are a few of us around. And I just find it weird that it's still an issue 30 years later, that it's sort of rare or unusual to have a play with middle-aged women in it. I've always been interested in middle-aged women. Oh, you're lovely, but I'm not interested in young, beautiful people. Because if I squeeze a character who is a middle-aged woman, she's done stuff, she's had stuff. She's had husbands, she's had deaths, she's had children, she's had parents die. There's stuff in there, and the stuff that's going to come out. So as a writer, I would always much rather write for the older person. But the great thing was that the casting of this, we had nearly every middle-aged actress in the world turned up. <laughs> and, oh, she's great! You know, we had an absolute pick because there are two parts. There's a female lead uh, with the male lead and there's another middle-aged woman who's quite bonkers. She's a Latin American-born dancer type character. But they're fun parts and they're real women. They're not um, caricatures or women who look younger than they do. Yeah, so why do you think that isn't? Fashionable. As you know what it's like, uh, everybody has to look younger, whether it's Botox or facelift or you know, the line erasing creams. I mean, you cannot move as a middle-aged woman without being told you must and can look younger. And the exercise, oh God, the exercise. You know, lose the weight, go on the diet, get thin, get slim, look young. And I see women who I know are my age and they've had the full job and they look 25, you know. and I. It's a terrible pressure put on women, and what makes me really upset is it's still now. There was a whole article just recently in one of the papers about women of 50 plus, and everyone said, she could pass for 30. I don't want to pass for 30. Anyway, there you go. That's the middle-aged woman rant over with. <laughs> So where did your inspiration come from with Company of Strangers? Well, I very sadly uh, put my own father into a home, mainly because I had been the sole care of my parents for 10 years. My mum had Alzheimer's and dad was in a wheelchair with double arthritis and a lot, lot of other complications. And my mum died and it got to a point where I couldn't literally cope anymore. I think that happens to a lot of people. And I, don't, I still feel a pain that I put my father in a home. Mm because he was in the company of strangers. However nice they were, he was, it was not his home. And I feel very bad about that. And so I think that's where the idea came from. And everybody in the play is at the end of their sell-by date. They are hanging, I mean, apart from the obvious thing that the old people are within the home, the matron in the play is hitting 50 and trawling through dating agencies to find, still find the husband, because she still wants to have it all. And the, the main character, Nick, who is the senior nurse in the home, he has been fleeing from a terrible mistake he made in A&E hospital eight years ago. And he thinks the mistake is on his file. And he thinks the personnel file has followed him throughout his entire career. And that's his fear. And he's hiding in this nursing home because he's terrified they will find out about what he's done. And he is pursued by this. So it's a slight dark thriller there, mm. set against the comedy of the, the bonkers entertainment duo and, and, and the matron. And, and then into all of this come two work experienced teenagers who were useful because they could see the nursing home through fresh and new young eyes. Mm. I remember when we were doing research, we went round to nursing homes, myself and the character who plays Nick, the, um, the man who's running from eight years of fear, 
we, we, we were not surprised by the nursing home, and I particularly wasn't because my dad had been in one. And we took with us a young designer who was sort of not even 30 summers. And he was kind of, because he couldn't believe how awful it was. And I suddenly saw it through his eyes. So I used the work experience kids, which was a bit ruthless, but uh, they're quite fun too. And they're brilliantly played. Uh, by two young people, Ara Mawawi and Rebecca Farrell. And this is their first major role. And they, they're coping wonderfully with it. And I ought to say that Matron is played with a brilliant comic performance. Absolutely fabulous, almost fast, but it's brilliant, by Imogen Bain. And uh, Nick, the man I wrote the play for, is played by Alan Charlesworth. And he is the man who is fleeing from the terrible secret. And the one old person in it is played by Derek Wright. He plays Ken, who used to be in the RAF. And he has the voice of, of the people within the home. And he has a lovely scene with a young girl when they actually start to talk to each other across the generations. And that's really sweet. So you're no stranger to controversy, what with your 1980s play, Sorry. Yeah. Came out. Did you ever expect that kind of Well, no, because I, when I wrote it, it always takes about five years to get a play on. You write it, you send it off, they say it's crap, you send it back again. This goes on for years. So five years later, it went on at Sheffield Crucible, just when the Yorkshire Ripper was in Sheffield doing what he did. And it was a play about rape. So, and it was about sexual harassment, which in those days, it sounds silly now, but I'm sure to your generation, in those days, men still said things like, I'm sure she asked for it. They really did. I mean, I know young men these days don't quite believe it, but they did. And it was important to me as a feminist to actually show men, this is what it can be like. This is what rape really is, the control, the brutality. It, it's not just rough sex. Anyway, so I wrote this play went on in Crucible Sheffield. But in fact, the Yorkshire Ripper wrote to the theatre. In fact, he wasn't the Yorkshire Ripper. He was that man who pretended to be the Yorkshire Ripper mm. and was then jailed for it, I believe, many years later. Uh, and he said he would attend the performance and he threatened the life of the leading lady who was going to be raped. So on the first night, we had eight policemen with short black hair and big black shoes trying to look as if they weren't policemen in denim amongst all these denim-clad lesbian feminists in the <laughs> audience. You could see them thinking, oh, I suppose the overtime's worth it, you know. Um, so that was, quite, that was quite weird. But I, the, the controversy that that then in, engendered, uh, it was actually questioned in the House of Parliament at one stage. Because again, I was surprised, because I, all I was saying was, it's really easy for a woman to stumble into a bad situation. The plot was, she was going for a lunchtime drink with somebody in the office, the photocopying machine man. And he said, oh, I'll take you in the car. And she thought, oh, oh, okay, she gets in the car. He gets to his flat and he says, look, I've just been to B Jam Freezers. Can we put this stuff in my freezer or it'll melt? So she carries this frozen meat up to his flat and wallop the door shuts and that's it. And I sort of wanted to say, because people say, oh, why on earth would she go back to his flat? That was a foolish thing to do. I wanted to say to people, look, this is how easy it can be. This is how this can happen. And... And you, you, we didn't, I didn't have a so-called sex scene, so I never want that. It was more about the mental torture he puts her then through for the next hour, where she is, this sort of feminist girl, is kind of reduced to an absolute jelly through the manipulation and cruelty of this man. And uh, then she has to go back to her office afterwards, and he walks into the office, and she hasn't told anybody. And it's, So it, of, of its time, it was very topical and very radical. So I suppose that's what I'm sort of known for. Mm -hmm. But I must stress, because I don't want people to be disappointed or misled, this play is not a political play. No. It's very much a personal play. It's, it came from my personal life. It's about mortality, death, ageing, being at the end of your sell-by, hanging on by your fingertips, lost dreams and people not being where they thought they'd be. And so it's a very personal play. It's not a political attack on nursing homes, and in no way is it an expose of nursing homes, which it's been billed as in certain press, I know. It's not, that's not it. If I'd wanted to write a political play about nursing homes, I would have, but this isn't it. This is a personal, about one man's fears and terrors. I've always written about real people, and 
emotional issues. I'm more interested in that than the kind of what I would call intellectual theatre. I think I prefer character-led dramas about people and about the dilemmas that we all find ourselves in. I find a lot of theatre divorced from anything of my experience. But I mean, nearly everybody has got a mum or a dad or will have to put them at home or not. Everybody's been a kid at work experience. Everybody's got a granny or a mum. You know, it's, my things are often, I think, probably more family-based. So what advice would you give to, do you have any advice for young, aspiring writers? Oh God. You've got to network, you've got to be in with a group, you've got to have a group of you who are producers, agents, playwright, you know, people who are going to be filming. And they form a private company and then they take the company to a theatre and then buy it. When I first started, if you wrote a good play, and you sent it to seriously good theatres, you'd probably get it on. And I was very lucky and I had a lot of plays put on. It doesn't happen these days. No. So I don't know. <laughs> good luck is all I can <laughs> say. Godspeed. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't give in. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking with thank us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah.